Welcome everyone. I am Jennifer Baker, the Special Events Coordinator for Compassion Consortium, and I'm joined tonight by the co-founders of Compassion Consortium, Reverend William Melton, Victoria Moran, and Reverend Sarah Bowen. Tonight we'll watch the Veganuary documentary together to see their journey over the last 10 years, bringing a vegan lifestyle to people worldwide. We'll learn more about their start, growth, and the impact they've made in opening the doors to how important veganism is for our health, compassion for animals, our environment, sustainability, and the world. We'll laugh and learn together, and we might even master the exact correct pronunciation of Veganuary. After we watch the film, Victoria will have a conversation with Wendy Matthews from Veganuary to learn more about their movement's success for all and how it can inspire our lives. Now let's go enjoy the show. I'm Victoria Moran. I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of the Compassion Consortium and so happy to be asking some questions and sharing your questions with our wonderful special guest, Wendy Matthews, who is heading up things for Veganuary here in the U.S. So, Wendy, I'm sure you are busy all year round, but since it's January, I'm sure you are extra busy, and it really means a lot that you're spending this time with us. Thank you so much. Of course. Hi, Victoria. It's nice to see you, and it's wonderful. great to be here with you all. Great to see you again, too. I mean, you're just, since I saw you last, you're just out there in the world doing so many amazing things, which I think really mirrors the movement as a whole and, and what incredible things are happening. So I first heard of Veganuary in 2014 at VegFest UK, and I, they had a booth. And I remember thinking, what a good idea. But the idea that it would be like this today would have, have never crossed my mind at that time or, or perhaps anybody's. So as you look at the tremendous expansion today, what does it say to you about veganism in general? Then we'll get into Veganuary specifically. Sure. So just to give you a little bit of my background, um, I've been with Veganuary for four years. So since we launched in the U.S. in 2020, but before that, I was working in the movement. I was working for Farm Sanctuary. And I'd heard murmurs of Veganuary. You know, I thought of it as this kind of quirky niche UK campaign. But it was on my radar because everyone was talking about it. Um, I was seeing all the progress they were making and, and was really impressed. And, um, you know, it's been amazing to be a part of, of launching it here in the US. But I think that the success of Veganuary here and abroad really speaks to you know, a couple of things. One is, of course, the public warming to the idea of veganism. Um, you know, when I first got into the movement 15 years ago, no one no one knew what it even meant to be vegan. Um, and now I think it's pretty mainstream. Even if, you know, someone isn't full on vegan, they've probably at least heard of or tried vegan products, at least in the major cities. But in, you know, in addition to the public being more open to it, um, I think businesses are as well, you know, for altruistic reasons or, you know, in most cases for uh, for profit reasons. I mean, they see that the market is there, that people are looking for these products and it's uh, it's much easier to, to sell the idea of getting involved in a vegan campaign now than it would have been, you know, even five years ago. So let's talk a little bit about the translation of Veganuary from the UK to the US. I mean, England has always been so far ahead of us. I mean, I was able to go vegetarian when I moved to London in 1968. So even then, they had restaurants, they had plant milk, they had things that, you know, we just had, had never heard of over here. And even watching the film, it just seemed like there's, it just seemed like there's a lot more over there than, than here at this point, but that doesn't mean uh, we can't catch up. So talk to us a little bit about how you do things differently in the States and what kind of success you're having. Sure. Yeah. So the UK has about a five-year head start, um, so they've been at it for 10 years with the Veganuary campaign, and at this point, it's really a household name. And I think we're seeing a lot of movement here and a lot of progress in kind of saturating it culturally to the same point. Um, and there are some benefits and some challenges to being in the US. So on the plus side, you know, celebrities here are massive, um, you know, most 
celebrities that we're working with are, you know, Hollywood celebrities. So they're really well known in the U.S., but also abroad. And that's helped get the word out in a big way. Um, we've had support from Joaquin Phoenix and Billie Eilish and just some really big names that have helped us to get the word out to the American audience. Also, I think that um, health seems to be a really big driver in the U.S. So the main motivators for people to sign up, you could probably guess them, health, environment and animals. Uh, the U.S. audience seems particularly interested in health. So we tweak the messaging a lot to focus more on the health benefits to get them in the door. Um, so once they are signed up, they get all the information about the environmental benefits. They get lots of information about animal agriculture and you know how eating vegan helps animals. But we focus on that first touch point of what will attract them to the campaign. And often that is health. I want to ask you about that because... There seem to be so many people in this country who love animals and who would love to not eat animals or animal products, but they believe so fiercely, and many have been told by doctors that they must have grass-fed beef or yeah. whatever it is. So do you see that that's a particularly American problem, and how do you address it? Good question. I do see that as a at least a stronger American problem. And I think that has a lot to do with subsidies and dairy lobbies and, you know, all of the, the dairy councils that were paying for the posters that went up in our childhood classrooms talking about the benefits of dairy. I mean, I just think that there's a lot of uh, political things to consider in, in so far as what we're taught as kids about health and nutrition. Um, and I think culturally also, you know, we're a, a nation of farmers and I think we really um, have some polarized dynamics around that. So, oh, sorry. I think I just had a little feedback. I thought you were um, interrupting with a question. No. Um, I lost my train of thought there. You but were yes, talking I do think about it's... we're a nation of farmers and yeah. there is sometimes some pushback, which actually one of the questions came in. In America, do you ever receive any pushback? We do here and there. Yeah, I think that vegan is still you know, a more polarizing term here than it is in other places. I think it's got quite a high trend factor in the UK at this point. Um, and we're getting there here as well. But, you know, I have seen a lot of businesses really want to jump on the the vegan bandwagon and use the term and, and connect with consumers in that way. And then I've seen some have some trepidation about alienating, uh, you know, some of the businesses they work with or some of their customer base. So, you know, again, I think I've, I've overusing this word polarized, but I think we are a very polarized country and there's always the the risk of alienation. So our our ethos of January is just to be as warm and welcoming and non-judgmental as possible. You know, everyone is welcome to the table um, and we want to meet them where they are. So how did we do this year? How are Americans showing up for Veganuary? It's been a really amazing campaign so far. Um, I don't have any official figures to share with you yet or anything like that, but we are definitely uh, having a really strong turnout as far as signups. And then just some really cool things happening all around the country. Uh, we had a billboard in Times Square on New Year's Eve this year, which gave us some great visibility. It said, happy January at the ball drop. Um, we also have gotten a, a ton of media coverage in the U.S. this year. So we've been on Today.com and Adweek, and um, it feels like there's a lot of buzz. But the thing that I'm most excited about is how many Veganuary specials we're seeing at restaurants around the country. So some chain restaurants like Hard Rock Cafe and Mellow Mushroom and Just Salad are launching vegan options. I mean, on their non-vegan menus to appeal to the veganuary audience. And that's wow. what really moves the needle. That is thrilling. So uh, Suzanne from Philadelphia has a question. She wants to know if you see a big difference between openness to veganuary in middle America versus the coasts, and do you have a different approach to different parts of the country? That's a fantastic question. And I talk about that regionality a lot because you know, at the moment, we're a fairly small team, we work with fairly small resources. And the message that we put out in the US tends to be a bit one size fits all. Um, so we have kind of our main campaign theme that we use across the country. But when I look at the demographics, you know, we did start out very much in LA and New York, um, kind of the obvious vegan centers. But now we've had signups in all 50 states. 
Um, I'm mm-hmm. seeing some Midwest chains like Blue Sushi Saki Grill, which is in uh, Indiana and Illinois getting involved. So, you know, without um, having like specific data to give you just anecdotally, I definitely feel like there's some more momentum in the Midwest now in year five than there was when we started. Yeah, it is exciting. And sometimes you just never know. Uh, William and I come from Kansas City, Missouri, and we just heard from a friend yesterday that they're opening their second whole food plant-based restaurant that's not Amazing. vegan, but has all of the, you know, um, follows all the rules of the people that want to do it super healthy. And that's that. in Overland Park, Kansas. So wow. the world is changing. So in um, in tracking the results, I know you said you don't have the specific data for this year yet, but in the UK, I presume they have got that down to some kind of a science. How do you guys know how many people did this and how they did? Yeah, I love this question because it's something we talk about all the time uh, internally. You know, we have one very obvious mechanism, which is how many people sign up through our channels, right? So they enter their email, they officially take the pledge, and they receive 31 days of recipes and content from us. But we believe and studies have shown that many more people than formally sign up are participating. Um, You know, it's like with something like Dry January, a lot of people have heard of it, and they're not drinking during the month, but they have no idea there's a nonprofit behind it. And we have the same problem. Um, And so one study showed 10 times the amount of people that sign up are actually participating. But we want to be able to speak about that in a more uh, tangible way. So this year, we're tracking a few different metrics. Um, We're looking at, you know, who is watching our YouTube videos, who is downloading our cookbooks, who is listening to our podcast, like, how many people can we say are definitely out there using our resources to try to get a better figure. But another thing we're doing is um, surveys in each country that we're in and asking the general populace if they have heard of Veganuary and if they've participated to try to get a percentage in each country. So we have another question. This is from Chi. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Is there any upcoming plan for Veganuary in Asia, especially mainland China? Yeah, that is Absolutely something we've been talking about a lot. I think it's a huge opportunity area. Um, My role actually is the international head of partnerships and expansion. Um, So that's something I'm personally doing a lot of exploring around right now. So we launched into Spain, Austria, and Greece this year. Um, And China is a country that's on everybody's minds. And we are um, kind of seeking the right partner. So typically we partner with organizations to help us adapt to the local context and to really make the the campaign their own. And of course, with China, there are a lot of challenges. Um, One being that the calendar year doesn't necessarily look the same. So the January, New Year, New You concept doesn't, you know, directly translate. And then of course, lots of language and tech challenges too. Um, But the short answer is, is yes, that is something we're exploring. Yeah, Veganuary is tough even for a native English speaker. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, another question from Suzanne. Does Veganuary have a mechanism to follow up with folks to learn if they go beyond January? Do they become vegan? How many? Yes, thanks for that, because that was part of an earlier question that I uh, don't think I answered. Um, so we do have a survey that goes out to everyone immediately after their pledge. And then six months later to kind of track their progress. And our retention stats are pretty consistent year over year. Um, So last year of people surveyed, 80% told us that they were making permanent changes to their diet. So what we considered a permanent change was at least a reduction of 50% um, how much animal products they were eating. Um, So 50% was the the bottom line. And then we had some people tell us they wanted to reduce by 75%. um, But of those 80%, 28% told us they wanted to stay vegan for good. Um, And that rang true at six months as well. So yeah, I think we're changing some hearts and minds in the long term. And, um, you know, I personally went vegan after a 30 day challenge 15 years ago. So it's a model I really believe in. 
Oh, well, and then no wonder, no wonder you were there doing all the amazing things that you do. I know several people have joined since uh, I introduced uh, Wendy Matthews from Veganuary. And if you have a question for her or a comment, you can just send that directly to me in the chat. I am Victoria Moran with an asterisk in the front. So I think I'm right at the top of the list and should be easy to find for sending your question. So how does it work? Just kind of walk us through the Veganuary year, maybe starting February 1st. What does it take to launch this going forward? So February is really all about evaluation and learning. Uh, so most of next month, in addition to everyone, you know, having a couple of days off to, to recover, um, we will be doing all of our post-campaign wrap-up calls, you know, what worked, what didn't, what can we do better, and calculating our metrics. Uh, so looking at how many media stories came in, what did the social media chatter around Veganuary look like? Um, and most importantly, you know, how many new menu items were launched, how many new products were launched, and how many businesses took the opportunity to, to shout about vegan products. So a lot of calculating next month. And then, you know, right off in the spring, starting in March, we'll really start planning for the year ahead. Um, the timelines are different for different pieces of the work, but I would say the first thing we hit the ground running with is the corporate engagement. So a lot of companies need, you know, at least the year to launch a new product or to, you know, plan out their January campaign. So we start the corporate outreach right away. And then we also run mini campaigns now. So we have a few throughout the year. There's dairy free week, fish free week, and one more chicken free week. Um, so those are just our ways of continuing to keep the audience engaged and educated about plant-based products. And then, you know, in summer, um, the corporate outreach work is always ongoing, but then we also start to refresh our resources. So updating cookbooks, coming up with new meal plans, um, kind of figuring out how we're going to sell this idea of Veganuary because the campaign is essentially the same every year. It's working with businesses, it's getting people to sign up for 31 days, but we need a fresh hook and a fresh energy to bring attention to it. So this year, our theme was vote for veggies. Um, and yeah, we'll see what we come up with for 2025. And I'm interested in your vote for veggies campaign, which uh, people can see on a lot of social media platforms. It's a very, a very clever a little uh, one minute clip that that is very much if, if you didn't know what it was, you might think it was a political PSA of, of some sort, but it's not vote for veganism or vote for health or vote for cruelty free. It's vote for veggies. And I find this really interesting because I'm seeing in so many places plant powered and plants do this for you and you've got vote for veggies. So how can we use our wonderful relationship with the plant kingdom to help get the word out? I love that that's how you opted to do it. Thank you. Yeah, the, the thinking behind that was, you know, most most people wouldn't dispute eating your veggies, right? Your mom's been telling you to eat your veggies all your whole life. Your doctor's been telling you to eat your veggies, right? And I think that we're in a moment in time where there's a lot of criticism around processed food and a lot of... Um, a lot of money from the meat industry going into kind of demonizing plant-based products. And we want to remind people that, you know, the, the original plant-based food is, is healthy, whole, you know, plant foods. Um, so, you know, we're not uh, discouraging consuming all plant-based alternatives, of course, like we still work with a lot of amazing companies like Beyond Meat to talk about how you can replace, but we also want to talk about uh, all the beautiful, healthy options that you're probably already eating. Um, and that we can just encourage people to to bolster. So, yeah, um, <laughs> the vote for veggies was a lot of fun. And in the U.S., we decided to uh, kind of riff on the theme by electing the vegetable of the year for 2024. <laughs> um, so we came up with a panel of experts, and this included, you know, uh, Maggie Baird, who's Billie Eilish's mom and the founder of Support and Feed. We had Tabitha Brown. Um, we had a produce manager from Kroger. I mean, just a whole group of folks from different nutrition councils and food, food futurologists, <laughs> which I stumble every time I say. Um, but we gave them some categories like versatility, popularity, sustainability. And ultimately, they came up with the purple sweet potato ah. as the vegetable of the year. So 
that was one of our kind of fun press angles for the year. That's cool. You can't go wrong with uh, purple vegetables. So uh, Eduardo has put a note in the chat. Hi, we are three people watching from Brazil. We would like to know how is Veganuary in Latin America, in Brazil nowadays, and how could we help? Wow, thank you so much for asking. And hi, thanks for joining. Um, so we just officially launched in a way in Brazil this year. Uh, we've, we've had some energy in Brazil for a while and we've had a Latin American manager, but we now have a director for Veganuary specifically working in Brazil. Um, so we do have the pledge available in Portuguese and we have someone doing corporate outreach work in Brazil. Um, I right now oversee the US, India and Spain campaigns. So I'm not as involved day to day in Latin America. Um, so as far as how to get involved, I can point you in the right direction, but I don't have any direct uh, direct suggestions. But I will say the campaign is going really great in Latin America. We're seeing huge numbers of signups, um, some really cool activations from Starbucks and, and Subway. So yeah, it's been incredible to see uh, how much energy there is down there. I noticed that in the film, it said in Starbucks, no extra charge for non-dairy milk in England. Ooh, that's not happening here yet. Hopefully it will. I know we're working on it. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about India because it's such an interesting place. It's kind of the birthplace of Ahimsa. And yet uh, there is a dairy um, cultural and, and religious connection that's quite strong. So tell us about the campaign there. I know it's not yours, but I'm sure you know about it. So what are they doing there to make it specifically appealing to people on the subcontinent? Yeah, India is really interesting. And um, so we, uh, we're just talking about wanting to do more with reminding people about, you know, all the great veggies they can eat and almost um, helping balance that stigma around plant-based proteins. And in India, it's kind of an opposite situation, which is that many people are already vegetarian. Um, and it, it's, you know, a lot of folks see their parents' generation eating vegetarian and eating veggie heavy diets. And that almost seems very traditional. And so, um, you know, there's this push towards innovation and actually exploring more alternative proteins. So whereas like here we're pushing vegetables in India, um, you know, it's still very popular messaging to talk about alternative proteins and to bring, you know, new alt proteins to the market. Um, so yeah, I think that that's the biggest differentiation between the the campaigns here and in India. Fascinating. So how do you get along and how do you work with other animal protection, other vegan kind of organizations. And I'm thinking particularly in the UK, because I know the Vegan Society has been there forever. I wonder how they responded to somebody coming on the scene and getting all this attention. How does it kind of work behind the scenes with other organizations? Veganuary is made to be given away, is what I always like to say. Um, you know, we are, are not precious at all about... Um, you know, this is our work and this is what we do, right? We want Veganuary to be something that lifts all the boats um, that companies can take on and make their own, that other nonprofits can take on and make their own. So we have great relationships and partnerships with a lot of organizations all around the world, some who actually take the campaign and run it. Um, so L214, for example, is a group in France that officially run the Veganuary campaign as our partner. Um, but we also, you know, have other partner organizations that we work with on like co-promotion or sometimes behind the scenes corporate work. Um, so, yeah, I would say that we have a very collaborative spirit with other organizations and have seen a lot of benefit from that. Oh, that's lovely. That is cool. So when you have so many things that you offer people and you might go over that a little bit, if, if for those of us who've never done Veganuary, what do we get for those 31 days? And then what do you find people like most? Is it recipes? Is it answers to questions? Yeah, so to give you the rundown of kind of what you get if you officially sign up and take the pledge, um, you get a daily email from our team. I think in the documentary, you saw Stuart talking about, you know, sign off on the email. So Stuart writes all the emails um, that they have recipes, tips, meal plans, kind of everything you need to get a little daily encouragement. 
And within that, there's also educational info talking about your impact on the planet, on animals, and on your health. And then you also get downloadables. Um, so a celebrity e-cookbook, we have seasonal meal plans, we have low budget meal plans. Um, it's all completely free. And then you also get access to our Facebook group where you can go and get advice and support and kind of, you know, talk to other people that are doing Veganuary. But we also have moderators who are former participants that can be there to support and answer questions. It always seems like the food gets to people. I mean, more yeah. than anything. It's like, give me a recipe, give me a recipe. And, yes, you know, and if it's good, we get points. <laughs> Absolutely. So, there is a question here uh, from uh, Kimmy and Karen O, and they are up in British Columbia in Canada, where they are veganic farmers, which is very cool. And their question is, how is Veganuary catching on in Canada? Yeah, thanks for asking. And hi, thanks for being here. So I'm seeing a lot of momentum in Canada right now. Um, we've seen a good amount of media coming from Canada this year. There was a CBC story recently about Veganuary. Um, and the corporate world in Canada is really interesting too. So London Drugs had an in-store Veganuary display this year. I think they're in Vancouver. Um, we also have a brand called Conscious Foods that does plant-based seafood I've been talking to that's doing some activations this year. So I'm really interested in Canada in terms of expansion. Um we, you know, our model is typically to partner with another organization. So if you have any suggestions of great Canadian nonprofits, send them my way. So that goes for everybody. Oh, here is another lovely question. Um, I know there is no one size fits all, but does Veganuary have tips for us vegans who have resistant family members who won't give up meat and dairy for even one day, things you have learned over the years of the folks who did participate? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. You know, we talk about it a little bit in the pledge series. I think most of our messaging is focused on those people who have decided to make the leap and that are um, kind of ready to put their foot in the door. But we do have an email that goes out about those social pressures, right? The difficulty with um, maybe living with someone who's not interested in Veganuary or attending a holiday meal. And I think the to generalize it, I just think the warm, welcoming, non-judgmental thing in, in my experience has always been the way to go. You know, I was definitely a young, fiery activist once who was um, <laughs> fighting with my dad at the dinner table. But I think just by leading by example and, you know, being in my best health and creating beautiful food, um, people slowly start to get curious. And then those conversations can happen in a way that's less guarded. Uh, the, the biggest tip I probably have is don't talk about it at the table. I think when someone is in the middle of a meal, that's when they're going to feel the most defensive. So I think uh, bringing those conversations into like less tense moments uh, can be a way to help grease the wheels, I guess. Yeah. And I'm sure your dad is very proud of you. I remember after I'd been at this for years and years, my mother was uh, in her eighties and she said to a whole group of people, we used to think that Victoria was nuts for eating that tofu and doing that yoga, but now doctors tell their patients to do that. So I think sometimes we're getting uh, credit <laughs> even when we don't know um, and speaking of younger people and those who guide them, we have a comment here. I'm a school teacher. And the question is, I am wondering about the youth. Are they interested? What can I tell them? Yeah, I would say that I think that there is a lot of interest from youth, but specifically with Veganuary, our audience tends to skew a little bit older and not not older, but, um, you know, we're not as much working with like the teens or, or you know, preteen segments. And I think the reason is we primarily started um, with Facebook and Instagram. Right. So I just think it has to do with platforms a bit. And that's kind of where we've been and where our groups exist. And I think that tends to be, you know, more of the 
the millennials and the the Gen Xers. Um, but we are kind of moving into TikTok. We're looking at ways to reach younger audiences. And there are some amazing groups out there that are you know directly focused on younger audiences. So I guess I would uh, be curious what your experience has been around, you know, the youth interest and, um, and I think humane educators, you know, are out there too, and, and probably be great people to, to ask. How would you suggest that um, a teacher, presuming that the school allows this sort of thing, uh, would bring up something like Veganuary? So not not being someone in the education system, so this is a little bit of a um, a guess, so forgive me if it's a, a dense answer, but my feeling would be you'd have to get buy-in from the teachers, the faculty and the staff first before you could start uh, disseminating it to the kids. So we have something called the Veganuary Workplace Challenge, and we have had groups of teachers do it in the past at different schools. And you know, get really excited about it and get invested and then convince their cafeterias to offer a vegan option for the faculty that were participating. And then the kids get curious and the kids want to try it. So yeah, I would say maybe starting with something like that and starting with the staff first could be interesting, but um, yeah. Cool. That's what I think <laughs> Jennifer has some response to that. Hi, Wendy. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? <laughs> it's nice to see you live. <laughs> you too. Um, I, I did have a question. I'm the director of a charter school here in Prescott, small town here in Prescott, Arizona. And I, I just want to touch a little bit more on that because, oh, it makes me crazy sometimes seeing what the kids eat and, and you know, what they don't get to eat, that kind of thing. And they, they don't know, you know, um, anything more. And I wonder if, I think definitely touching um, with the teachers and things, but how could, I just wonder, kind of some ideas on how we could engage the parents to really, without... Again, um, scaring them, forcing it down their throat. But how do we, how do we just start with it? You know, and Veganuary is a great way to do it because it is so approachable. Um, you know, so I just wonder if there's a way to it, looking into your future here, maybe really start looking at the school age kids and even the schools that provide a free lunches, things like that. So yeah. I just wonder more about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, and one that, you know, I don't have any expertise on. So I'll, I'll kind of riff on it for a second. But um, I will, I will say, you know, it's not an area that I know a lot about yet. Um, we are working with universities a lot right now. So one thing we've done is partner with HSUS to do a food forward program, where we offer through them, but we offer training uh, for the cafeterias to offer more vegan options. So in those cases, we really had to get the cafeteria staff excited and get the, the people working in the cafeterias excited. As far as parents go, I think that's probably a whole different ballgame. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, I have worked with um, a charter school actually in Brooklyn. I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but they did send emails out to that. Well, they got the faculty on board and then they sent emails to parents inviting them to participate. And um, the school didn't burn down or anything. So I didn't hear any really negative stories. I think it went okay. Um, but I know there's like politics when it comes to communicating with with parents too. So yeah, um, well, we could, we're very, very small, like 65 children small. So oh, well. we, we, could, we could be your, your next um, person to test it on if you'd like. <laughs> I yeah. would love that because we have a lot of um, ways to be a little more open a little more unconventional we have that leeway as a charter and so it's nice to you know let, let's just reach out and 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 see what see what sticks and see what people are interested in or have a talk night with the parents yeah. and we really want to help support you in how to how to feed your kids well you know just start with you know just vegetables absolutely <laughs> so I think that yeah. would be fun so yeah and I can put you in touch too with the teacher at the other charter school um who might have some advice on how it went there I yeah, do you think one of the, one of the great things about Veganuary is it's like this bite size introduction, right? So I think sometimes people are scared off by the idea of really long term change or what will this look like, mm -hmm. you know, if we're making this massive shift. But if it's just let's focus on this for a month, let's try some new things. It's a little bit more palatable. So, um, yeah, I think it could be interesting as a educational night or something for parents. Yeah. I think it'd be great. We start with we start with the kids because they just they don't know what they don't know. And I think it'd be great. So thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. So um, a lot restaurants were mentioned in, in the piece and a lot of restaurants doing Veganuary um, specials. So how does that work? Do they come to you? Do you approach them? And do you see any kind of trend that one kind of restaurant is more interested maybe than some others? Yeah, a little bit of both. So I would say when we first started in the U.S. in 2020, it was definitely a lot of um, proactive outreach, going out to the restaurants, kind of familiarizing them with the idea of Veganuary and what tools we had available. And as time's gone on, we're definitely getting more, you know, reactive. Um, a lot of restaurants are approaching us and saying, hey, we've been thinking about adding a vegan option. You know, we need some support. Can you can you help us get this off the ground? Um, so, yeah, a little bit of both. And last year we had over 450 businesses across the U.S. participate, which is really exciting. Um, as far as segments participating, I would say it's been a real pizza party in the U.S. this year. So a lot of pizza chains are getting on board. And I think part of the reason is it's quite an easy swap. You know, it's just removing dairy cheese and adding plant-based cheese, which is pretty easy to implement in a kitchen. And um, so Mellow Mushroom did a pizza special there's a chain called And Pizza that did a special this year, um, Sizzle Pie. So some of these smaller regional chains have really gone all out. Um, cool. Yeah. Wonderful. So we have a, another a question. Oh, this one's interesting. How are you sensitive to the history of the vegan movement being perceived as very white and sometimes not culturally sensitive? Is Veganuary able to work with the BIPOC community and its leaders in the U.S. to respect and celebrate cultural diversity? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And definitely one that we are, we're thinking about and talking about a lot within Veganuary. So a couple of things. Um, we try to work with and partner with organizations that, you know, that we can, excuse me, uh, that we can reach new audiences with and kind of speak to experiences outside of the experiences of, you know, myself or um, other people that are writing the content. So we just worked with Black Vegan Society in Baltimore um, to get Baltimore to proclaim January as Veganuary. So they're the first city to ever have done that. Um, and then within that, we, you know, sent out a press release, a joint press release with Black Vegan Society talking about their work. So you know, just whatever we can do to kind of amplify the amazing things that are already happening on the ground in different cities. Um, and it's also a lot to do with our ambassadors. So trying to find voices that speak to different communities. Um, so we, yeah, try to find the right voice for the right medium to connect with the right audience. Um, a good example would be Tabitha Brown. When she came on and did a video for us, I saw a huge uptick in the amount of Black Americans that are participating. And we don't collect that demographic data, so I can't give you figures. But, you know, I just saw in our Facebook group and and the people that were getting involved, um, which makes sense because proportionally Black Americans are, you know, becoming vegan at a much higher rate than, than white Americans at the moment. Yeah. Very cool. So finally, because this is film night, I want to ask you about the film. So why was it determined that this would be a good plan? What what was the kind of history of the of the doing a film? Sure. So we knew we had to do something special to celebrate 10 years. And I think that, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that Veganuary has kind of taken on a life of its own. You know, there are so many more people doing Veganuary than we even know about that are even signing up. Um, it's become this phenomenon around the globe and, you know, especially in the UK, I mean, truly, truly everywhere. And I do think that not everyone knows that there's a nonprofit behind it and there's, you know, blood, sweat and tears behind it. And there's, um, you saw the story of Matthew and Jane who, you know, moved back in with his mom to, to make it happen, right? Um, so there's a lot of passion in this project and we just wanted to tell the story of the way it's grown and also um, remind people that there are a lot of free resources they can access if they sign up, right? That's what we're here for. Um, and also to seek support, right? It's a great tool to be able to send out to kind of show the impact we've had to potential funders and to businesses who want to get involved. Wow. Well, my final question is specifically to you beyond your current position. What's it like to spend your whole life 
working for the animals. And to anybody here who just dreams of the day when they can do that, what will it be like for them? Yeah, I consider myself very, very lucky uh, to have kind of almost stumbled into the career path that I've come into. Um, I was a combined environmental studies and English major in school. I was going to be a journalist. I wanted to write for National Geographic. And I took a job at a sanctuary um, kind of until I found my real job, right? I was going to work at this local sanctuary and um, be there until I, I found out what I really wanted to do. And it turns out what I really wanted to do <laughs> was work for animals. Um, I absolutely loved it. I love the nonprofit space. I love getting up every day and doing something that really aligns with my values. Um, and it keeps me going too. You know, I think everyone has hard days at their job and we have days where the, the state of the world is overwhelming and we feel like nothing we do can make a difference. Um, and being able to hear stories of people who are having these incredible experiences, whether it was in my last job at the sanctuary, you know, watching them connect with an animal for the first time, or in this job, hearing about people whose lives have been transformed by a plant-based diet. It's really, really rewarding. Ah, well, it sounds wonderful. So I hope you've inspired some people and anybody who's thinking, oh, I could never do that. Maybe you can, maybe you can. The animals are on your side. So thank you so much, Wendy. Thanks for this delightful film and for spending this time with us this evening. And we will all be looking forward to uh, getting the word out with you guys next year. Thank and I'm you. turning it now, thank you, over to Reverend Sarah Bowen to close us out. Be happy to. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Jen and William, for orchestrating this event and tech for, uh, and tech, and Phil for keeping all our technology going uh, and keeping the room um, civil and well attended to there on that bridge that you have behind you. Uh, if you are new to us, Compassion Consortium is an interfaith, interspiritual, and interspecies community. And in addition to doing events like this, uh, special events on book talks or film talks, we also have a Sunday service that we do on the third Sunday of every month. Uh, and I will put a link in the chat here for you all in just a moment. Um, but I in invite you and encourage you to join us on our next Sunday service, uh, which happens at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we get together, we have um, some meditation, we have a, a song, we have a special guest to Victoria interviews, we talk about compassion in action, we do blessings, prayers, all sorts of different things to help our community stay together and also to help some of us with um, some of those kind of difficult moments of advocacy uh, that can happen for us or of feeling alone or feeling uh, like we are not supported. We are a community that supports each other and helps us through some of those difficult things that that come from being an activist or an activist or an activist sometimes. Um, on our next Sunday service, it is February 18th. We will have Venetia Calloway with us as our special guest. And we'll also be talking about uh, our animal chaplaincy program a little bit. So as we come to a close, I will put the link to, uh, to that as well as information about our special guest so that you can read a little more uh, about her. And the last thing that we will do uh, is we tend to end with a little bit of a blessing, kind of interfaith, as I mentioned, very wide, very inclusive but if you would all take a deep breath with me and we offer this intention out to the world based on a Zen chant, may suffering ones be suffering free and may the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and the sick Find health relief. As you go out tonight, I wish that for you and for all who you love and all who you care for. And thanks for everything that you do for animals and for humans. And here is the link for Sunday service. Thanks, folks.